at The Brain Possible, we are all about living life in a way that is as non-toxic as possible. That's why we're especially excited today to speak with Kathleen Halla, a founding member and advisor for non-toxic communities, a proponent of non-toxic herbicides, and a mother of three boys. When her children were struck by autoimmune issues, she became aware of the dangers that exposures to toxic chemicals pose in our children's environment. For many years since, Kathleen has been doing her part to encourage communities to eliminate children's exposure to toxic pesticides on school grounds and in parks. Today, she is dedicated to working to help clean up the environment for our kids and families. So what specifically is Kathleen doing about it now? And what can we do about it as parents and citizens? Let's begin. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for joining me today. I'm really excited to learn from you. Um, let's start at the beginning. Tell me about your sons. I understand that they had autoimmune challenges. How are they today? They're much better today. I'm very grateful. Uh, it's been many years of, of caring for them and figuring out what was going on and finding methods of helping them to heal. They're older now, they're 19, 18, and 16. And um, I'm super grateful for all the things that I've learned that helped them to heal and get better. When they were young, their autoimmune issues were, they, they could have been much more severe, but luckily mm -hmm. we addressed them uh, when they were very young. We got on it immediately. and. Uh, we did a lot of things that weren't necessarily that mainstream, but now I think they're a little more mainstream, like changing their diet. Yeah. Um, you know, going with organic food was a huge piece, enormous. We watched gluten and dairy for quite a while. Now they kind of eat what they want. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they limit it. They're very respectful of their food. My youngest one, not so much. He'll kind of eat anything, but the older mm -hmm. two, especially, um, you know, all of us are very conscious about diet and I started talking to farmers and I wanted to find out what was in our food supply, what was really going on. So there was this one farmer from Iowa who came out to California to speak on Prop 37 about labeling GMOs and I met him then and I couldn't believe the things he was saying about what GMOs are and what the crops actually, you know, entail in terms of raising them and what's going into our cereal boxes and what's going into our meat supply and our dairy. So once I learned those things, uh, we went strictly organic. We, we changed over and we, we ate out less and we yeah. ate out more and that's how we were able to budget it. Yeah. Yeah. Once you learn about these things, it is hard to, um, we can't unlearn it. That's right. And so you just dive deeper and deeper into, uh, well, that's how it has been for me. Yeah, but um, it all of that research into diet, like how can I help my kids? Can it, can one piece of their you know recovery come from cleaning up the diet? And it turned out it, it was really a, a critical part. And, mm -hmm. but in doing all that research, I ended up learning, you know, a lot about farming processes, like what's in the fertilizer, yeah. uh, what are the seeds treated with, what kind of technologies are these big GMO companies selling to farmers like mm -hmm. Bayer and Syngenta, which is now I think ChemChina and all these chemical companies. Basically it's massive chemical conglomerates that are producing seed and selling it to farmers along with all the chemicals needed first to plant the crop and get it going. And then all the chemicals needed to treat all the disease that comes from these crops, which use this high tech, you know, genetic, uh, you know, process that actually in the end makes the soil sicker and the crops sicker. So then as the soil and the crops are sicker, the farmers buy more chemicals to fix mold, fungus, mycotoxins, whatever's coming. Right. Uh, that is actually increased by the way they're farming. This, this chemically based farming system is really a problem. But, yeah. you know, I, I became aware that the same chemicals that I was being warned about by the government scientists who were retired and the farmers and the vets and the pediatricians who were looking into all this, 
I realized that those same chemicals were being used on our school grounds and in our parks. Yeah. And so that's what motivated me to get to work in my city and, and start a group. Um, I was very active in my PTA. I'd been in the arts and I was very active in, in fundraising for my district for music programs and additional school nurses. Mm-hmm. And um, so when I was on the PTA board, I, my friend said, well, you know, the, the, the chair opened, the chair of health and safety opened and they said, Kathleen, you need to take that. They, they knew how concerned I was about yeah. these things. And so um, while I was in the PTA in that position, I made sure that we had pediatricians, farmers, pesticide experts come and talk or write to our PTA, write to our superintendent and just educate, educate, educate. And a lot of the education was on glyphosate and Roundup and how ubiquitous it is. It's the most widely used uh herbicide in history, it is everywhere. They use so much of it, it's in rainfall. Like it's, there's no yeah. escape. And um, so all this science was being presented to our PTA board. And I also uh, had a lot of other science on other products that are used, uh, organophosphates and other products being endocrine disruptors, you know, affecting their sexual development and their brain development. And basically what our baby girls are being exposed to now will affect the health of the babies they have one day because girls are born with all the eggs they'll ever have. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff is cumulative and and girls and boys also have inherited uh, what their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were exposed to. So it, it, it accumulates in our kids' bodies. So I just thought I have to try to do something to protect the children and protect our community, not to mention our pets, the environment, you know, we're in California. So the dolphins, the whales, because all the runoff goes right in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So it's a big concern that people need to be aware of that, that these, these chemicals that are sort of casually or regularly used around our communities are having an effect on Mm -hmm. all of us who are living there. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about, um, for maybe some people who, you know, haven't taken the plunge into diving into this topic yet, what, what some of the problems are being caused in children's health with, with all the glyphosate use, um, and the roundup. It's, it's kind of a hard thing to, to talk about because there are so many thousands of studies. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, when I first started, I thought, I wonder if I can find some science on this. And now if I go into these academic sites with these published peer reviewed papers and I put in say organophosphates or you know, causing endocrine disruption or mm-hmm. causing neurological damage or taking away IQ points from our kids, mm-hmm. there are thousands of studies, thousands. I just get buried. So well, it's that's really good though. Hard it is good that that's good. It's good that the knowledge is out there, but there's like a barrier, you know, Tyrone Hayes from UC Berkeley, who speaks about atrazine talks about this. He says that there's sort of a, you know, division between what's going on in the published scientific world and what's for sale at Barnes and Noble. So, you know, the majority of our population, you know, they're not reading scientific journals. So the science is there, but a lot of people aren't necessarily seeing it. But in general, I mean, off the top of my head, first, the the cancer, different kinds of cancers, uh, liver damage, kidney damage, uh, damages the stomach lining, uh, contributes to leaky gut, uh, Mm -hmm. damages the brain, um, either IQ or brain development or neurological function. Mm -hmm. And if pregnant women are walking through the park and their baby's growing in their womb, uh, that can hurt the baby. Um, And then the fact that all these chemicals, you know, endocrinologists have found and epidemiologists have found that these chemicals are carried down for at least four generations. Wow. And they affect those generations. And what's interesting is that uh, like in mouse experiments for things, if if a mouse is exposed to a toxin, um, sometimes that the effects of that toxin will not show up in the next generation. It will skip that generation. And then it will go to say the grandchild and the grandchild will show all these effects. 
but it really came from the grandmother having been exposed. So it's, it's hidden, it's insidious, it's hidden. And it, you know, I hear sometimes people saying, oh, it's genetic, you know, all these health issues with our kids. It's not true. It's not possible for the, for all the things that are going on with our children uh, to be genetic. 54% I think it's higher, but the last time the, the government did their you know analysis was in 2006. And as of then, I think it was 2006, 54% of US children had a chronic health condition. Mm -hmm. That is unacceptable. Yeah. And these kinds of things are just insidious and they come from here and there, a little exposure to plastic, a little exposure to whatever, flame retardant in their crib mattress, a little exposure to pesticides. Yeah. And these things affect each person differently, which is where genetics can come in. But mm -hmm. the fact that we've had such a rapid change in the, in the health of our population confirms that it is environmental. These yeah. changes are environmental and we are robbing our children of good health, good neurological function, IQ points, uh, the abil ability to have healthy babies or healthy or babies at all. Uh, our fertility rates in the US have plummeted. There's mm -hmm. a fertility clinic on every corner now. Uh, even teen pregnancies are down and my farmer friend likes to joke and he says, do you think that's because they're behaving? <laughs> you know, like, you know, Certainly not. I think that's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're not, they're not, no. big, but yeah. their birth rates are down. So, you know, it's, it's a concern for everyone. It's across the board and all of us need to wake up and pay attention to what we're being exposed to and especially children, especially. Yeah. It's scary. Um, so when did you start noticing your boys' symptoms, their autoimmune symptoms? Um, my, it was my oldest uh, mm -hmm. who showed the first symptoms. And sometimes that can be typical because just like for whales or any other mammals, the first child gets the most toxins from the body of the mother. And so oh. I breastfed all my kids and a lot of toxins are stored in fat and that's your milk, you know, goes through your fat. And, mm -hmm. and I learned these things later on, but my oldest uh, started to show symptoms when he was seven. Mm -hmm. So it was not from birth. Um, and it was a sudden change and it was extremely frightening because no doctors could uh, explain what was going on with him. Mm -hmm. And we went to several doctors and different, you know, experts everywhere. And everyone had a different idea. Some suggested different medications. Mm -hmm. None of them agreed. And yeah. everyone was baffled. And that's what's happening with parents with these problems with their kids. You know, it's very hard to find answers. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to find the treatments that are right for your child. It was a struggle, but my husband and I were fortunately on the same page and we kept going from expert to expert to expert. I mean, top level experts, like the best we could find. And finally mm -hmm. we found a, a specialist uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins. He was a PhD from Johns Hopkins and he actually helped our children, but it was a real struggle. And, um, I really feel for the parents out there dealing with these kids and all the different conditions that are so rampant now, it is a challenge. But mm -hmm. the, the reason why I hang on to the pesticide issue uh, so strongly is not because I feel it's necessarily the only cause or the only yeah. thing we need to watch out for. I don't feel yeah. like it's the low hanging fruit that it is uh, the, the use of these chemicals around our families is so commonplace and people are not thinking about it. And, and I have discovered through my years of learning and training that uh, there are fixes for these that can work for everyone. They can work for the city employees, they can work for the moms, they can work for the kids. So I just feel like there needs to be a complete change in the way we manage landscape around our families and that yeah. there are answers it can be done and it's an obvious thing that we should really focus on so that's kind of my special area is in the landscaping arena and it's been nine years now I've been in it and I you know my background's in art history I have my master's degree in art history I'm a researcher 
I was a private art dealer and I loved that job and I still love art. And I still go to museums and think it's the most wonderful thing ever, but our children's health just took priority for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what can be done? So this is a topic where actually I uh, reached out to, to you um, through Dr. Michelle Perro, and I was asking her, I think, I don't remember which one, which happened first, but I was asking and looking for myself because I became concerned about, you know, as I clean up my own environment, they, you know, you have someone come mow your lawn or take care of your yard and they just start spraying stuff all over the place. And I'm like, wait a second, I'm cleaning everything in our diet up and in our environment as ever, you know, I buy a new mattress, I buy an organic one. And I'm just trying to do all this, but then I'm realizing that they're spraying things all over the yard and the kids run around, the dog runs in there, brings it all in the house. And um, so I don't know like where it does, you have been in it and you say it's easy uh, to clean well, up, but what, what are the steps that people can take like to start to have a clean uh, yard or in their at their kids' school, as you say. Mm -hmm. Well, I co-founded a nonprofit called Non-Toxic Communities. And I was vice president of Non-Toxic Communities for years. And the reason my partner and I set it up was to help other people know where to get started. And when I say it's easy, I would say it's easy once you get everyone on board and deciding that that's what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. The hard part is getting uh, your landscape guys or decision makers, say your mayor, your city council, your school board, to actually decide to implement this. Um, more and more are realizing that this is a, a valid concern and more, or more, more and more are agreeing to do it. And so uh, what I meant by it's easy is that there are solutions that can be used mm -hmm. to reduce or eliminate right. the toxins from landscape programs. But the first thing always to do is to get decision makers to go along with this and decide to do it. If you're talking about your cities like, or your schools or your parks, mm -hmm. um, if you're talking about your own home, well, you're in charge. Yeah. If you're in an HOA, then go to your board or get on the board and say, look, if we're going to pay X number of dollars per month to this landscaping company, we need to hire a landscaping company who's willing to do it responsibly. And um, it can get a little bit tricky in there because there are companies who claim to be organic or oh, use yeah. organic methods, and then they're not. Yeah. And there is quite a bit of that. Um, I can't, I'm very sympathetic with the anyone who's a landscaper, it's grueling work. They're probably not making a fortune and they've only been trained in chemical methods because almost all of the training programs are, you know, uh, done by extensions that mm -hmm. train these guys in the chemical methods and they, they'll hear, you know, roundup is king. And if anyone complains, they're just wrong, it's perfectly safe. But the truth is those are the guys who are actually the most exposed mm -hmm. to these chemicals. So I have met so many though in, in this journey and especially recently with what I'll be talking to you about with what I'm doing now. And they're realizing that, that there needs to be a change everywhere and we need to change our ways. But I think always the first decision, at least with the city is to approach your officials, find, make partnerships with them try to get them on board. Uh, if you go to non-toxic communities, there's a ton of information on how to, how to do this. You mm -hmm. can also go to the website of Beyond Pesticides and they list, you know, they'll not only help you to do this, but they'll tell you about the chemicals that are being used and you can research them and you can see, you know, what the chemicals, what the products are, what the chemicals are in them, what the chemicals can do to you and all the regulatory information. The chemical and regulatory information. Sorry, my son's coming in the house. Um, so there is information you can get out there. I also recommend visiting PAN North America, P-A-N. They're, they're a good source for information. So beyond pesticides and PAN can be good information on the chemicals that are being used 
and in terms of converting your community, um, non-toxic communities can help you very much with that. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend that. But I have stepped down from the nonprofit arena because I discovered a product that's a weed killer that can be used in place of products like uh, glyphosate, which is Roundup typically, or uh, glufosinate. Glufosinate is sort of, in my opinion, glyphosate's evil twin. Uh, of all the GMO crops, back to the farming, the way GMO crops work is uh, these companies bought up all the little seed companies took the ones off the market that were the best hybrids for either number of years of corn per stock or drought resistance, or maybe even insect resistance. They bought up the seeds, they own them, and they take the seeds and they put a gene in them to make them uh, what's called glyphosate resistant, resistant to the herbicide. Mm -hmm. So that now the farmers, instead of going through and spot spraying the weeds carefully so they didn't hit their own crop, now they can go through with tractors and big booms of pesticides and just blanket the whole field in, say, glyphosate. Mm -hmm. um, and their crop will survive and all the surrounding weeds will die. Right. This is what happened at first. Now it's a disaster because all the surrounding weeds have evolved and now they're also resistant to glyphosate. So now the farmers have a huge problem because no matter what they put on their field, the weeds are still overtaking the crops. Um, 80%, I think more or less the breakdown is 80% of all GMO crops are what's known as Roundup Ready or glyphosate resistant. Um, the other 20% of GM crops are glufosinate resistant. Uh, that's a I think generally made by Bayer, it's called Liberty Link, Liberty Link crops, and that's glufosinate. And so what's happening is that all, as all the awareness of the dangers of glyphosate uh, because of the lawsuits uh, for the non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma mm -hmm. uh, have been widely publicized, everybody's saying, let's stop using Roundup, let's stop using glyphosate, which is a very good step. However, what I'm finding is happening really across the nation is landscapers are substituting glufosinate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would make sense. You, they pull out one thing. It's kind of like when they pulled out, people yeah. started saying, oh, BPA is really bad. Let's yeah. take BPA out of all the plastic because that's what everyone wants. That's right. What people still today don't realize, a lot of people, is that you take the BPA out, but they still put in something else. Yeah. Because they, they, they have to use something in, yeah. in your mind if they're so. And they want to listen, right? They want to listen to people. They don't, they want to reassure people. So they say, oh, we're using, you know, sometimes it's called Cheetah Pro. It's sold under different brands. And they say, they, they're literally telling homeowners or residents it's considered organic, which is like completely untrue. But they're, that's what's happening. And that's called sort of greenwashing. And in all fairness, it could be the dealers that are saying that it's considered organic and the landscapers really think it is, but it's yeah. not. Yeah. It's well, not. so um, can we pause there for a second? So you can't, it's my understanding that like for, if you go to the, buy soil or something, it doesn't, it's not regulated. So it may say organic on it, but you don't really know because that's not regulated like your food with the organic seal. Is that correct? Or did I get that wrong? Mm, kind of. There's an <laughs> there, it, it's kind of complicated, but there's an issue with the soil. There is a Clean Water Act in the US. There is a Clean Air Act, but we never passed a Clean Soil Act. So what I'm going to share with you is kind of disheartening, but people should know. Yeah. Um, it's another reason to buy organic, I'll tell you what. But when we have our sewage plants, whatever goes down the drain from the hospital down the road or the mm -hmm. body shop next door, mm -hmm. somebody dumps oil, you have chemotherapy drugs or your neighbors who are taking hormones or whatever medications. Yep. That's all going into our sewage system. And in the sewage system, I don't know if any of you have ever flown over, but they have these big lakes that they sort of dry out. And when they dry them out, 
they chop up what's left and they put them on fields as fertilizer. So they're using that product on sometimes schoolyards, parks, crops. Like if you buy conventional crops or GM crops, wow, that's what they're using for fertilizer. It is completely legal. So whatever your neighbor ate, consumed, was, was treated with, yeah. uh, whatever your other neighbor dumped down the drain, you know, whatever's in that drain mm -hmm. ends up on our fields. So on our right. crops, in our parks, and it's, it's bad. So fertilizer is a really big deal and you need to try really hard to find clean fertilizer. Now, the problem is that a lot of what's OMRI certified, from what I understand from my expert friends who've done lab testing, mm -hmm. is that it can also be hazardous. But by all means, buy the organic product over the conventional, mm -hmm. because at least then you have a chance. And there is one brand of product that you asked me about to research, and there is one fertilizer. Oh, I didn't note it. I knew this was going to happen. Oh, you said key something. Key to life. Was it called? Hang on. I'm so sorry that I didn't note it. I just had a friend who seriously vets this stuff. Key to life. Key, key to, to life. life. And I, I wanted to find something that would be available to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I have no affiliation with the company, but mm -hmm. my friend who's very into the subject recommended it. It can be purchased on Amazon. So that oh, way great. It get exposure, but really I talked to a farmer friend about it and he said, it's so obvious, go up to the back of a cow and use yes. whatever you get, <laughs> you know? So if you can find a neighbor who has farm animals or even horses and they're careful about what those animals are fed, meaning the feed is clean because a lot of hay now is Roundup Ready. Yeah. It's Roundup Ready alfalfa. So it's all sprayed with Roundup. And what goes in is going to come out. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a farmer that feeds, you know, organic or, you know, clean food to their animals, go get some of their poop. That's, that's my very best suggestion. And there yeah. are other things you can do. You can make compost tea at home. You get like mm -hmm. a plastic bucket and you stick some leaves in it and some liquid and 24 hours later, you have an amazing fertilizer. There's uh, an expert on this. His name's I think David Johnson, Johnson or Johnston out of uh, New Mexico. And he's a master of this compost tea, but you can Google compost tea or you can ask organizations for information. Like I am accredited by the New England Organic Farming Association in landscaping. I wanted to get landscaping training so that I could understand what I was asking of our landscape professionals. And I could also learn about the cleaner, smarter, better methods that can be used to solve landscaping problems instead mm -hmm. of just going to the Home Depot and buying the latest chemical from Bayer or Monsanto or whoever. There are solutions to home gardening that you can do yourself that are far cleaner, probably more effective and safer for everyone. So um, yeah, compost tea, your neighbor's farm or the products oh, like key to life. Yeah. And if worse comes to worse, at least buy organic. But I, I will tell you that uh, it's not very closely regulated and it's not always as clean as it could be, but I would say you have a much better shot buying that than you do buying conventional. I mm -hmm. would never, ever buy conventional fertilizer for my, my yard, my home. I would not do it. Mm -hmm. And all landscapers need to be asked not to use conventional fertilizer. Yeah. Um, do you have a concern about, you know, what kinds of plants people are buying at the store and bringing home to plant in their yard? Or is that just like, okay, just take the low hanging fruit and worry about the fertilizer going on your yard? Well, I, I would say look for the plants that have not been treated with neonicotinoids because, you know, look for the garden stores that care. There are organic garden stores. Look for the ones with conscientious owners. Do your best. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't always be perfect. And, uh, but for example, there was a big movement that went out, you know, to get these big nursery companies or stores like Lowe's and Home Depot to stop selling, you know, plants that people were buying for pollinators 
uh, that have been treated with ne neonics because then that's going to kill the pollinators. So it defeats the purpose. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is sort of education and then us asking companies to do the right thing. But you kind of have to do your research and be conscientious about where you buy and what businesses you support. So right. do your best, do your best to find clean plants and clean flowers and use, you know, safer products around your families. It's actually not that hard once you set your mind to it you can find these sources mm -hmm. they're out there and they're growing look for you know neighborhood csas these small sustainable farmers who are who are popping up ask them for advice mm -hmm. they'll help you go to your farmer's market if there's one of them selling meat you know say what do you feed your animals could i buy some poop probably they'd be happy to help you out. So mm -hmm. I think it's up to us to sort of take control and not be limited to what they sell at Home Depot. Right, that's good advice. Um, I was just given, I just did this lunch leaders program out in um, Topanga Canyon in uh, Malibu. And uh, we were given a, a, as a gift from Apricot Lane Farms, some fertilizer, I think it was worm poop. <laughs> And it just looked like dirt to me. I was kind of like wondering what it was going to be when I opened it up, but it, it was just looked like really rich dirt. Um, so I think that other farms are probably offering that. All kinds, you know, worm casings and worm, worm poop is excellent. And the, and the neat thing is if you've got young kids, you can involve them in this and that will teach them to be aware of where food comes from, how it can be grown responsibly. Mm -hmm. And it gets into all kinds of other subjects like science, biology, zoology, entomology, all these things that'll interest kids. You can do this in your backyard. You can have a compost bin and have worms and, and check it out with your kids, you know, and it can be like a family experience. So you're not only, you know, raising clean food or creating clean fertilizer for your for your household you're also teaching your kids to think about these things and right. say, oh. so it's really a win-win and that that does take energy and I know all of us are stretched thin but I know a lot of parents who've done it and it's been great for family activities yeah so how did let's go a little bit back when you went and approached your um, was it your child your children your boys school where you first approached was it yes. the city were, uh, um, school school first school. Yeah. um well how did the community react to your concerns they um they liked it i mean they did? yeah oh yeah everybody did everybody was supportive um but what i would say is that i was particularly well connected with my district because I'd been on the fundraising board, the Irvine Public Schools Foundation for mm -hmm. a while. So I knew the superintendent and I also knew my principal and I also knew all the school nurses because I'd been fundraising for them. Um, I knew my principal because I'd gone in to visit just on my own several times asking what they were applying, when, why, how much, you mm -hmm. know, nobody asked these questions. So you know, you always have to be very courteous, very respectful. You can't run in there in a panic. You know, most of the time I was sort of fact finding to see what was going on. And then I was, I would go away and I'd be like, hmm, you know, what could be a better solution that works for everyone? Mm -hmm. You have to be sympathetic for the principal, for the superintendent, for the landscaping guys. They're working within a budget. They've got a team, they've got to manage. They have to get a job done. They want it to look good. If it doesn't look good, it, it goes back on them, right? Everybody complains. They're going to get the emails. They're going to get the complaints. Things have changed since I first started, though. When I first started, like, I was a little bit alone in this sort of movement. Since the Roundup lawsuits uh, were won, there's a lot more awareness and a lot more willingness to look at better options, Yep. So, um, but I would say even from the beginning, you know, when I presented it to people, everyone was like, hmm, yeah, that makes good sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of like no one had ever thought about it before. And then okay. the light bulb went off. But, but the problem is once you get people on board and you get them to agree with what you're proposing, uh, then it's like, now what? And yes. that's when bringing in experts uh, is important, going to resources for training. And I cannot recommend the NOFA enough. 
Northeast Organic Farming Association. They train people, they will train your landscaper, they can take an online course and they can learn about all these things. They can uh, confer with experts who will help them, you know, even after the course. Um, there's a big movement to get professionals trained in yeah. organic landscaping methods. That's you know, awesome. the chemical industry decided that the perfect lawn was the thing they were going to sell what, in the 50s, I guess. And they took all these chemicals that had come back from the war, like mustard gas and terrible things that were used in the war. And they kind of, you know, tweaked them a little and they said, well, we're going to keep selling this stuff. We're just going to convince people they need the perfect lawn, like no clover, heaven forbid, there should be a patch of clover, which actually pushes nitrogen into the soil and makes your grass greener. But there were all these things. And it was funny because when I first started this, you know, I would get people complaining to me like, oh, well, if we don't use these chemicals like 2,4-D, which is half of Agent Orange, which is in a product called Speed Zone, which they spray all over the fields, like directly on the field because it kills what's called the broadleaf and it leaves the grass, which is like a skinny leaf. So it kills clover say. And they're like, oh, what are we going to do if we can't use 2,4-D? We're going to have clover. Oh my goodness. And literally one of their arguments were was clover will attack bees and we will have kids being stung by bees, which I'm not making light of. Uh, one of my kids does have a bee allergy and it is a serious thing, but conveniently or inconveniently, the bees are disappearing. So I don't know of one instance where clover has attract bee, attracted bees and caused a child to be stung by a bee who had to run to the hospital. Mm. So it's, it's a non-issue. Some of these arguments they put forth are non-issues. Having a little bit of clover in your field adds nitrogen. It's a good thing. Mm. So, I mean, there has to be a little bit of common sense, but, you know, the chemical company sold our landscaping you know, professionals on the whole suite of products and you start with this and then you add this and then you add this at a certain time and a certain quantity, regardless of what your landscaping situation is. And then you're going to do this and then you're going to follow up with this. And then when you get the fungus mold and whatever comes as a result of using all those chemicals and having basically unhealthy plants and unhealthy soil, then we're going to sell you this, this, and this. And it works for them, but it doesn't work for us. And the, the thing is, in the end, when you have a responsible organic program, you have a lot less disease. You have fewer weeds. These chemical systems cause weed growth. When you have healthier soil and healthier plants, you have fewer weeds, you have less disease, and it's healthier for all of us. So there is no reason not to go organic or largely organic. In my own city, I will tell you, our policy is organics first. What that means is if they have an emergency, like killer bees invade the school district, they could use chemicals if, if they have to. It's if it's an emergency, if mm -hmm. there's nothing else that will work. But they have to try all the organic methods first. And I would say it's been over six years in Irvine. It's been a great success. Has it been 100% organic? No. There have been instances where they need to use some synthetic products. Mm -hmm. But the difference between what they were using then and what they're using now is amazing. Just That's amazing. Awesome. And we all feel so much safer. That's awesome. It actually, you, you just described the same scenario of what happens when you um, are using these treated seeds and then you have to use these other chemicals and other things. And on top of that, it reminds me very much of the pharmaceutical, <laughs> pharmaceutical industry and what's happening with our bodies as well. Well, they're, they're, the chemical companies and the pharmaceutical companies are cousins. Yeah. And they use the same methods for regulation, sales, all that stuff, all those shenanigans, you know. And in the end, you know, the the front the front lines are the moms and the dads who are paying attention to this stuff, who say, this does not make reasonable sense to use this suite of chemicals around our families when we could do landscaping more safely. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something else about this glufosinate that they're using everywhere. When they say, oh, we don't use glyphosate in order to reassure people and the people kind of go away and they say, oh, you know, we're using something that's considered organic and they want to make everyone feel better. Well, glufosinate actually is much harder on dogs. And so 
when they bring up the lab test, they'll show you the results on rats and they'll say, see, it's not that toxic. And then if you read the fine print, it's like it was especially hard on dogs. Well, mm. most families are more worried about their dogs than their pet rats at the park. So I'm just going to throw that out. And I, you know, it's frustrating for me because I know it's work to learn completely new methods. I know mm. it's work to seek out training at places like, you know, Northeastern Organic Farming Association. I know it's a little bit of work, but the thing that's surprising, and even in Irvine, they found this, was that it wasn't nearly as hard to change over as they thought it would be. And I literally have pictures of the guys, the, the staff standing at the first training. They're like this, mm -hmm. arms crossed, looking around. This will never work. And then I have pictures of them on the after, which is after a year and a half. We're in California, so our cycles switch over faster because of our climate, because we don't have winter to slow it down. So mm -hmm. when our fields flipped and they look so lush and amazing, then the guys are like puffing their chests out. Yeah, look what yeah. we did. It was so cute. It was really awesome yeah. to see that transformation and how they felt positive about it. Um, yeah, it's convenient to spray Roundup, but it's time for us to think about the consequences and not use those products and use smarter alternatives. And yeah, if you use an organic or a non-toxic product, maybe you have to spray it a little more. Maybe it costs a little more, mm -hmm. but you know, you're going to spend maybe more on man hours with organic methods, but in the end you spend less on product. Mm -hmm. So it kind of evens out. But even if you are spending a bit more in our city, we do have uh, one issue which makes it challenging for the organic methods. We use reclaim water because we're in California and we're a newer city and it's on reclaim water to save water, which is great, but they treat the water with salt and chlorine at the plant. So when we get the organic systems going and the soil biology starts to get healthier and we water it with salt and chlorine, that sets us back a little. So mm -hmm. we have a little bit of an ongoing battle. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if you're not using reclaim water, when the organic systems start going, they just thrive. And you save Harvard, Harvard did a study, they save 30% on their water. The reason why that happens is because healthier plants in organic soil, the organic soil has more life and it has more biology, more worms, and it's softer, it's less mm -hmm. compacted. Mm -hmm. Weeds you'll usually see in areas where the soil is very compacted or the soil is unhealthy. When you have healthy soil, it's sort of, I don't know, fluffier, less dense, more spongy, yeah. right? For a better word. And what happens is the water goes deeper and the plants grow deeper roots, especially grass, far deeper. What that means is there's less evaporation. So the water goes down deeper. The plants are taking the water from a deeper source. There's less evaporation. There's also less runoff. So on these fields that are treated with the chemical fertilizers and all the chemicals and whatever, there's a lot of runoff because the soil is harder. It kind of sits on the top and the water washes off the top. In organic fields, the water goes down into the soil, feeds the plant and doesn't evaporate that much. And you don't have the toxic runoff. So, and, and the grass is more resilient to high use. That was another argument that came up when we talked about like sports fields and so on. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, the organic grass will never hold up. Well, actually organic grass is stronger against heavy use, like on oh, soccer wow. fields or sports fields. The plants are healthier, just like for us, just like for my kids, we switched their diet. They went to organic food. We stopped putting, you know, fast food or whatever junk they might normally eat, soda, whatever some kids might eat. Our kids didn't have any of that. They got healthier. They became more, resi more, more resilient. Mm -hmm. Their immune system normalized and became stronger. And it's the exact same with our environment and the plants. Makes sense. The soil biology and the plant biology is healthier. They become more resilient and stronger. You have fewer weeds, less fungus, less of the problems. I'm not saying you have none. There will still be some problems to solve, but it's amazing how those chemical systems actually cause weeds, fungus, all these issues that they then sell you another product for. So it works for them, but it doesn't work for us. And when you adopt more responsible technologies and uh, basically you go back to old school science, uh, the plants do better. The environment looks better. It's crazy. But, you know, one of the big arguments too was, oh, it won't look as good. It's going to look terrible. It's all going to look dead if we don't use these chemical products. But 
It's just, com that's completely untrue. That's a fallacy. It looks better. Um, so what does your day-to-day -day work look like continuing this mission? So you are now, tell us, tell us what you're up to now. Yeah, well, I stepped down as vice president of non-toxic communities because I wanted to start selling this herbicide that I learned about that mm -hmm. is completely non-toxic and works like you can't believe. And I was so excited when I heard about it. We actually, as a family, we've invested in the company and it took several years for it to be approved by the EPA in the US market, but it's uh, completely vetted and approved. We've done incredible scientific studies on it at the university level. Uh, we've done full toxicity studies, all the compliance. It's for sale now in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and 47 states in the US. Uh, we will be seeking approval for California, Washington, and Oregon next who have additional state regulations, but we're confident we'll sail through there because we've done so much of the testing. Mm -hmm. uh, our toxicity level is extremely, extremely low. Our product is not certified organic, but it is very non-toxic. And the reason it's not certified organic is because it has natural oils in it. And in order to be certified organic, you have to press the oils out. And we found in testing the different formulations that when we press the oils, uh, different uh, elements get into it like pith and peel and whatever, and every batch will vary a little bit. And this product works on technology. It doesn't work because it's full of any nasty, dangerous ingredients. Our product works on technology. And so the ingredients must be very clean and very precise. So we extract the oils using an alcohol process. It's not a dangerous process in any way, but it's an al alcohol-based process so that we get consistent oil. And uh, that's in the formulation. Also 20% acetic acid is in the concentration. But when you judge toxicity of a product, uh, what they measure is the LD50. LD50 is the more or less the lethal dose of a product that will kill lab rats. It will kill 50% of lab rats at a certain level, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how they measure it. Okay. So the LD50 for the concentrate of our product is already not toxic. That's already 5,000. I think it's milligrams per kilogram. Um, however, when you mix it and apply it, that number goes to 50,000 milligrams per kilogram. And the higher the number on the LD50, the lower the toxicity. So our number is like sky high non-toxic and uh, perfectly safe. I would have no hesitation using it around my kids, my family. You can use it in your own home garden. You can mm -hmm. use it around your city. You can use it around pets. We don't recommend that uh, grazing animals eat it while it's wet. We recommend that, the, that it dries, but it works so fast. It's absolutely amazing. People's eyes are popping out of their heads. Guys that are diehard Roundup users, when they use our product, they're like, holy smokes. And the thing about our product is that it doesn't just burn off the top and then the weed grows back within two weeks. We have gotten some efficacy at penetration. It's not on the level of Roundup. We're not as toxic as Roundup. So mm -hmm. it's not going to work exactly like Roundup works. However, uh, you can see the plants starting to die in about 10 minutes. And wow. uh, within a day or two, they're, they're just completely crispy. They're toast. And what's amazing is we're having success even when inv with invasive species in the South, it's killing the uh, tropical soda apple, which is a real problem for them. Uh, in Utah, we're using it, it's killing thistle. It kills poison ivy, poison oak. Um, it's working uh, in, in New England. It works against, I think it's called Pachysander, Pachysandra. Pachysandra, yeah, in I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, it works on that. So we are really, really, really happy with the product. And I'm starting to sell this cities, schools, universities. And um, yeah, we've got a lot of people out there testing it now. And I'm just starting to sell it to some big accounts. We've got uh, responsible, sustainable ranchers and farmers buying it. Um, unfortunately, it's not as inexpensive as Roundup. It's hard to beat that. Right. But the awareness is so high now that we need to look for other products that were actually priced in a, in a good spot. We're less expensive than other organic and non-toxic products in, in our space, mm -hmm. but we're more than Roundup and slightly more than glyphosate-based or glufosinate 
based products. I told, I mentioned glufosinate. We're right. I'm going to have to remember more. that. <laughs> yeah. But we're not, but, we're not terribly more than that. And, you know, it, it's like our mayor when, when they made the decision to go organic, you know, isn't it worth rearranging our budget to spend five or 10% more overall and have our residents be healthier? Safer? Yeah. Because really when they talk about the low cost of landscaping, they're talking about the low cost to themselves that month or that year. But what about the cost to the families if they do come down with cancer or their kids do have health issues or their dog comes down with cancer or whatever that goes on, that's just passing the cost on to residents. That's how I see it. Yeah. I see it as really like a hidden cost when they mm-hmm. say, oh, it's cheaper to use these chemical products. Well, it's cheaper for you. It's mm-hmm. not cheaper for my family. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, and you keep talking about dogs, and I have a friend whose puppy, where I got my dog at the same breeder, which is kind of scary, but it's a different line um, of dog. But her dog is only a year and a half old, and they just had to put it down because its cancer was so bad. And she's like, "How did it get cancer?" And I'm like, "Well, could be many things." Uh, you know, she's like all of a sudden starting to think about what gets sprayed on their lawn. And I think that it'll happen much more quickly with our pets and the, their cancer rates are going up. They'll eventually die of cancer, most of them. Yeah. But what's scary is if you also think about how this is, you know, your family's around that as well. Absolutely. Without a doubt. And I'll tell you, even our dog eats organic. We make homemade dog food. <laughs> Yeah. Is it like a raw dog diet? Uh, No, we don't do raw. Um, We heard sort of mixed reviews on that. Some people love it. Yeah. Um, Our vet said, you don't need to do that. Uh, We get, uh, I'll admit, we buy Costco organic, which, you know, for some organic, you know, people, they may be like, that's not good enough, but we buy everywhere. We buy Summit Costco, I've bought organic products at Walmart or, you know, Whole Foods or our local market or the farmer's market. We buy food all over. But for our dog, I'll just tell you, we buy Costco ground turkey and we throw in Costco organic um, frozen vegetables and a little little tiny bit of organic rice. Mm -hmm. And um, I make homemade chicken broth. We roast a chicken, organic chicken every Sunday. Yeah. And we save the bones and I make the broth and then that goes in the dog food. And we, we freeze that for in case anyone gets sick or mm-hmm. for the dog food, I make my own bone broth because it's super easy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can change your lifestyle to, to accommodate these things. But I would warn people also about dog food, very high in glyphosate. Like I would not buy conventional dog food. And our vet, you know, said there, there's not a dog food out there that that you couldn't make better in your own kitchen. So we just switched. That's but, great yeah. that your vet said that. When yeah. I got my puppy, I, I selected some organic dog food and actually it was gluten-free at first. I was like, well, why do dogs need gluten? But then the vet immediately told me, she's like, I really prefer if you use one of these big conventional brands. Mm-hmm. Um, and then gave me all this research on why they need gluten. But um I guess, I suppose what a lot of people do, you add rice, right? Yeah. Maybe that's what solves that problem. I don't know about grains. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, another topic. Our mission is just avoiding, avoiding Roundup. Avoid the Roundup. I will share with you. I asked my vet about the vitamins in the food. I said, well, what about, you know, when you buy dog food, they talk about the vitamins and he's like, nah, if you buy nutritious food, you don't have to worry about that. Buy healthy you food. You don't have to add like back. Yeah, I heard this recently. So vitamins are added to a lot of processed food because they, they've they been basically depleted and destroyed in the processing, right? Yeah, I will, I will tell you for a time, we did give our dog supplemental vitamins and I should probably go back to it. We should all be taking vitamins. You know, there's always this debate about whether vitamins are beneficial, but the truth is um, our food overall mm-hmm. has 50% less nutrition than it mm-hmm. did for our grandparents, like an apple right. in our grandparents day and an apple today, the apple today has 50% less nutrition. Right. We are not getting the nutrition we need. And that's one thing, you know, you see a lot of kids who are kind of chubby or a lot of people that have problems with weight. Uh, 
a lot of times that's not their fault. That is actually a sign of, of uh, tox toxic exposure. Um, like in the rats, you know, I, I think it was, might've been BPA or PFAS, you were talking about that. The rats were exposed and uh, some of the rats became obese eating like the same amount of food as every other, or mice, rats, they tested them on all of them. The same amount of food, like just a little bit of carrot, same as a neighbor, and one rat became obese and the other one didn't. And Pete Myers is a scientist uh, who's done a lot of studies on this and uh, Bruce Blumberg at UCI, uh, he coined the term obesogens. And these toxins, including you know, the chemicals used in landscaping can cause our children to be obese. Like mm -hmm. weight issues are a side effect of being exposed to toxins. Also with the lower nutrition, I think people are hungrier because their body's looking for more nutrition. So people mm -hmm. sometimes are eating more. They're still feeling hungry because their body's not getting the nutrients they need. So mm. I would recommend checking with your doctor, checking your vitamin levels and supplementing if you need to for, for dogs and for us, just because the soil from all this chemical farming, the soil is depleted of nutrients right? as a result of sort of over farming and using these chemicals. So the nutrients are not, they're not in the meat, they're not in the produce. So we, we all do need to watch for that. And, and the vitamins, having high vitamins, like with COVID, uh, high vitamin D3, there are a lot of studies that have been done uh, that show that if you have high D3, uh, you have an 80% chance of not ending up in the ER with COVID. Like that's, it's, it's profound. Yeah. The D3 deficiencies in the ICUs is profound. So mm -hmm. take D3 with K, take your vitamins, talk to your doctor about it. But yeah, I recommend that supplementing with vitamins only because of our chemical farming pesticide uh, situation, it, it, it does affect all of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so what are your top three um, or four steps that our listeners uh, can take today to clean up um, or to move your mission forward? I would say visit my the nonprofit I co-founded, Non-Toxic Communities. My mm -hmm. partner, Diana Carpinoni, is brilliant and if you if you're at the step where you need help convincing your city leaders or mm -hmm. your school board to switch, uh, you could go to non-toxic communities and you'll get guidance there on how to bring them around. Um, try and form a group, try and approach the officials and see if they'll switch. The one thing I will say that what's changed now versus when I first started is there's a lot more open-mindedness to these suggestions. When yeah. I first started going forth, I did have some officials or professionals look at me like I had three heads. Mm -hmm. and now, now they don't. Now they, now they understand it's a serious issue, especially because of the lawsuits. But yeah. I think there's just more awareness also maybe because of COVID, right? All of us are aware that it's just a better idea to keep our communities as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think you have kind of the wind at your back, but approach the officials and ask them to change and then go to non-toxic communities to get more tools and uh, ask your professional landscapers to get the right training. If they go to, you know, Northeastern Organic Farming Association, they can take an online course or uh, the city of Irvine brought in Chip Osborne of Osborne Organics. He's based out of Massachusetts, but he works all over the US, including Hawaii. And he's helping, you know, universities, cities, professional sports teams, private homeowners, whoever you want to convert to organic methods. So I will caution you though, against greenwashing. There are um, companies out there and, and uh, people who will tell you they are fully accredited and they know what they're talking about and they maybe don't know as much as they could. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, I would really strict stick for now with NOFA, with Chip Osborne. And there's one other guy out of um, Chicago who's very highly respected and I can't think of his name right now, but I could get it and you could post it. I think that if possible, get the very best advice that you can. Mm -hmm. But in terms of just starting out, uh, start out at non-toxic communities to get advice on how to do it. And then if you want to reach me for my weed killer, I'm now selling it. It's my new career. Yeah. And 
My website's not up yet. It's called Live Clean, L-I-V-K-L-E-E-N. There's only a landing page right now, though. So if you want to reach me, please email me at mm -hmm. k.halal, H-A-L-L-A-L, at contactorganics.com. K.halal mm -hmm. at contactorganics.com. The product is named Contact Organics. There is a web website for it. You can get information there. If you want to order, I ask you please to email me directly and I will arrange for you to have a special nozzle scent, which helps it work more effectively. And I will give you a discount if you mention Emily. So if you email me directly, I can get the product sent to you. You can, of course, order it on our site, contactorganics.com as well. Please mention Kathleen if you do. But if you contact me directly, I would be happy to help you and, and suggest ways that you might be able to get this going in your own garden or your community if you need help. Thank but, you. Um, there is help out there. There is beyond pesticides. There are organizations. And I, I encourage you all to take the steps, even if it's baby steps, even if first the first thing you do is say, you know, no more glyphosate or glufosinate. You know, take that step, say no more toxic herbicides, use mm -hmm. a safer herbicide. And then you can look at the fertilizer and then you can look at other things going on down. Instead of biting off the whole thing at once, you could start step by step. But the reason I left my nonprofit, which I love more than anything, and I love doing the advocacy for communities was because of this, this one product that I think is really key because when I spoke with professionals everywhere, their first question is, was always, what do you have to use instead of Roundup? Right. They also asked, what do you have to use instead of 2,4-D, which is the product I mentioned, which is broadleaf, where you go out in the grass and you kill certain weeds and let the grass live. But our product's even working for that. Our product is non-selective. It will kill everything it touches, but it, it won't kill grass if you just spot treat those weeds that are the problem in your mm -hmm. lawn and you use it in a weaker solution, we're finding that that's a good answer. So, you know, people need solutions. It's about giving solutions and giving them smarter options. You know, first you have to make people realize it's worth making this decision to protect our kids, our dogs, our communities. And the second thing is then how do we do this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's two different steps, but there is help available for you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with the Brain Possible community today to be complete? I would just like to say that um, having been a mom who's gone through like this mm -hmm. development of my life of motherhood, you know, it, it didn't it, it didn't turn out like I pictured, <laughs> you know, life will take you on different paths. And I know there are so many mothers out there struggling with challenges with their family and um, don't give up, keep researching, keep watching podcasts, read everything you can think outside the box. Don't stop at the first doctor you speak to. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think it's important to get pesticides out of your community, don't take no for an answer. Keep going. Mm. Keep a level head. Stay calm. Don't panic. And there is help for you out there. There are different resources. And Emily, I know you're on this and you have your podcast and you are a good source for answers. And keep digging. That would be my advice. Oh. It's funny. I'm talking about landscaping. I'm saying keep digging. But I yeah. think keep digging for whatever problem it is that you need to solve. Uh, Keep going until you find the answer that you need because there are more and more resources out there and our family's health is the most important thing. Thank you. So. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful advice. I really appreciate your time today and coming joining me today on the Brain Possible podcast. I know that your time is valuable and I appreciate you spending it with me. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Emily. I hope that you enjoyed our conversation today and that you learned something new. Do you have a question for Kathleen? She would love to hear from you. Would you like to hear from the non-toxic community? Let us know how we can be useful in your journey. Email us at info at thebrainpossible.com. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and share our podcast if that feels true for you. You may also consider visiting our website for more information on stories, therapies, and products that we think that you will love. As always, thank you for spending your precious time with us at The Brain Possible. 
See you all next week and be well.